everybody. This is Alan with uh, Meet the Thriller Author. And on the uh, podcast today, I have Carter Wilson, who is the best-selling uh, author of seven critically acclaimed uh, standalone uh, psychological thrillers. Uh, he's uh, also written uh, many short stories, and he's an ITW Thriller Award finalist, a four-time winner of the Colorado Book Award, and his novels have received multiple starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and Library Journal. Uh, pretty impressive, pretty cool. Carter, welcome to the uh, podcast. Thanks, Alan. It's nice to be here. All right. So can you tell us a little bit about your uh, background and your journey to getting in to your first book published? Yeah, I, you know, I certainly had, didn't have aspirations of being a writer uh, ever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, grew up in Los Angeles and I went to school in New York and I studied hotel administration. And that led me into, um, I worked in, in hotel operations for a couple of years, but I basically got into consulting for the hospitality industry and in my early 30s, like literally one day, you know, during a class uh, for continuing education for a license I used to have, I was bored and I, I kind of posed myself a riddle, a murder mystery riddle. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to spend the last couple of hours of class trying to answer this riddle that I just made up just to keep me entertained. And I couldn't figure out the answer. So I went home and it kept, it bothered me that I couldn't figure it out. So I started kind of writing out you know, this whole backstory of, you know, all these events that would lead to solve this stupid riddle. And within 90 days, that turned into a 400 page manuscript. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing. I had never taken any kind of writing classes and, you know, pro could probably count on one hand, the number of books that I read in college that, um, that were fiction. Um, and that kind of started it all. I had, you know, I had this pretty strong business background. So I started learning about the publishing industry and figuring out, well, what do I do now? And I you know, learned about how to find an agent and all that kind of stuff. So it just, you know, and that book never sold, but that's what started it all. It just, it was just this light switch kind of turned on in me, which has never happened before or since. <laughs> that's pretty impressive too, because usually you have like a, a ton of start started manuscripts and never finished you actually took that one all the way to the to the end that's pretty impressive for the first first try <laughs> yeah yeah it was funny because i was almost not even almost i was actually embarrassed that i was writing i didn't tell anybody um i didn't because i didn't want to be that person who tells hey i'm writing this novel and then a year <laughs> from now like how's the novel going and you say i never finished it I literally, I mean, I kept from my wife at the time. She had no idea I was writing this manuscript because I was so convinced I wouldn't finish it. Um, and I was thoroughly convinced that it was terrible, um, which it was. Uh, but, uh, you know, so it's taken me a long time to kind of get past that feeling of <laughs> insecurity, which, which a lot of writers carry along with them. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've interviewed many, many uh, authors in this podcast and everybody is like, yeah, they've got the imposter syndrome, no matter what level of success, which is kind of encouraging for me as a writer too. I'm like, okay, I'm not alone. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's funny because, you know, I came at it from such an angle of, you know, literally kind of just being dropped into it. Right. So without any experience, so I really had the, <laughs> I think it was valid to have imposter syndrome uh, because I didn't know anything. Um, so it was learning from scratch. Um, and so, but, but the positive of that is that with all the rejection I've received over time, you can kind of embrace that better, knowing that you suck and saying like, oh, help me get better editors, agents, whoever's writing me this three paragraph rejection letter. Um, and you start to, if you, if you can, if, if you can embrace the rejection, it's so, um, meaningful, right? You can learn so much from everyone telling you no, um, not just motivation, but actually real advice about your work. Yeah, yeah, especially when they put a little, yeah, like you said, like a little paragraph or something in there, like a little criticism, constructive criticism. That was also helpful instead of. Yeah, I mean, I, I was astounded. So my first three books didn't sell. So I was, and I was always astounded that these New York editors were writing me like literally three or four paragraphs to my agent about why they didn't want my book. I'm like, geez, not only did they read it, they were really telling me why they didn't want it. Mm. And, and it was so useful, you know, it's no fun being rejected, but if you can, if you can mine it for, for yeah. gold, you know, it's, it's, it's great. So it's interesting. You say you weren't much of a fiction re reader. Why, why do you think you, you were drawn towards mysteries and, and that? Uh... 
I mean, I wasn't much of an anything reader. Um, I read a little bit in high school. Um, and, you know, I was living by myself in San Francisco in my 20s. And I kind of, I kind of discovered fiction at that point. Um, but I always had, I always had a thing for like, you know, Stephen King and Dean Koontz. Um, but, um, but I, I think I, you know, I think I have a dark side, like <laughs> we all do. Um, but I, I like writing about conflict. I like writing about struggle. I like finding, um, I like finding a character who I maybe identify with and then they throw like horrible things at them and just see what they do. Cause it's interesting to me. Cause I like that, that feeling of, well, what would I do in this situation? Um, so while my stuff is dark, it's really about this you know, to me, at least it's about the struggle of kind of getting to the light. Um, and that to me is interesting and always has been. Yeah. You're known for your uh, psychological thrillers and uh, your latest one, the dead husband, uh, it's going to be launching in on May 4th. So by the time this podcast airs, it'll be out. So people Yay. go check that out. <laughs> so that's exciting. Are you getting close? So a, a month, uh, is it? Is it always kind of uh, nerve wracking the leading up to a launch or how does that feel? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I just actually wrote about this, but there's, you know, this is my seventh. So there are some things that are, you know, don't carry the same weight that they once did. But there are other things like, you know, a couple months before is when you start getting the trade reviews and, and you're like, oh, I hope they don't hate it. <laughs> yeah. um, so once you can kind of clear that hurdle, that kind of feels good. And, uh, you know, trying to see what the pre-sales are and stuff like that. But it, the the further along I've gotten, the more I've just kind of been able to let things go. You know, I do what I need to do. I work with my PR team and everything, and for sure I promote. But I also try not to obsess about it and hope everyone likes it. Just you know, try to put put it out there in the wild, and <laughs> you know, you kind of release it, you know, and then hope hopefully it'll do well. But you know, I will. I try not to obsess over it. It's a little different. Uh this year now with the whole pandemic thing going on. So like probably a lot of virtual zooms like this, right? That's probably what it is. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Which is kind of nice because, you know, I had a lot of friends who went through it last year, um, you know, book releases during 2020, which I didn't have one come out in 2020, but all because it's May, all of my events are still online. And I think, you know, unfortunately it's kind of towards the end of all of this. So people are really like <laughs> sick of being online, yeah. but, that being said, you reach a much broader audience, right? I have fans who are, you know, um, are, are beyond just, you know, where I live. Mm -hmm. And that's nice to, you know, have them be able to partake in a, in a book launch as well. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the dead husband, uh, what, what it's about, how it all came together for you? Yeah. So I don't outline. So every, every story oh, wow. I have is, is just kind of a germ of an idea. Um, and, and sometimes it's just an opening scene. And I, you know, just like, just like that day where I posed myself a riddle, tried to figure out that riddle with the 400 page, that, that's how I write today. I like, I usually just set up a scene and I'm like, I don't know who these people are or why they're doing what they're doing, but that kind of is interesting to me, the scene. And then the rest of the book is trying to figure that out. Dead Husband was a little bit different. I, I knew a couple things going in. I knew I wanted to create my own city. I'd never done that before, my own town um, in New Hampshire. Um, and I wanted to write a book about two sisters. And I don't know why. That just kind of struck me as like, I want to write about two sisters. And I decided that they were going to be estranged and that one of them was going to return home to the childhood town that she grew up in, to the childhood home that she grew up in, this huge mansion. Um, for whatever circumstances, and I decided, oh, her husband died. Her husband died accidentally, and now she's returning home. And and I just thought there would be a lot of conflict. There was that's like, why did she leave in the first place? And so, you know, I, I wanted to make sure there was something in their past that drove her from the house. So that was kind of just the the initial seeds for it, and it just kind of grew from there. And it's the first time I've actually written with a with a secondary character point of view from a detective. So. That was my kind of first foray into a procedural, and that was fun to do as well. And your books are now, so your books are developing standalone so far. Uh, right. What's that? So every time you, you just get an idea and you have to start like with a blank page, kind of curious about that versus a series. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the attractions to me, right? It's like, you know, as much as you try to, and after a number of books, you start to get an idea of like, okay, this is this is who my audience is, and this is what they like, and this is what I like. But it, I do write a lot kind of for myself. And so to me, it's super exciting to like 
to just discover new worlds. That's why I very rarely write about places I know. I'm like, I'm going to set it in Manchester, New Hampshire. I don't know anything about Manchester, but I'm going to go there for a few days and figure it out. And to me, it's just that the the, the process of discovering a whole new story is, is exciting because I only write for about an hour a day. And so I don't think about my stories at all until I sit down and then I'm in this world. And to me, it's just an escape. So if it's unfamiliar to me, it's exciting because I get to explore as opposed to, oh yeah, I totally know everything about this. Um, so it's challenging, but it's, 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 it's like reading a book. I want to explore whole new worlds that, that I didn't read about before. That's really interesting that you write an hour a day because so many people say, oh, I don't have the time or, or anything like that. So what's your writing process like uh, when you're in the project? Yeah, I'm a firm believer in that the idea of there not being enough time is is an excuse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I truly believe there's enough time in everyone's lives to do what they're passionate about, right? And if there's not enough time, or if that's the excuse you're using, then it's a signal that maybe it's just not something you're passionate about. Um, because I still have a full time job um, in the hospitality world. Uh, so I, I write an hour a day. And, it, you know, I knock out probably if I'm writing, writing, you know, I try to do 500 words or so, but I might be editing. But, you know, my book is to get, or my goal is to get a book done in about, you know, nine to 10 months. And then, um, you know, I need time for, you know, doing more drafts and getting feedback from my agent. So, you know, really a book a year finished, ready to go is my goal. And with an hour a day, seven days a week, it's totally achievable. Um, it's not that hard. Um, all that being said, it's not like on the weekends I write six hours because I just don't have that muscle. Uh, yeah. I can't. I, I lose my. I lose my creativity, and I, I just get tired, um, and it just turns to shit. So, but if you know that hour is usually pretty quality. And what is uh, what do you use to write your your books? So I'm just curious about that. Is that like Word? Or oh yeah, simpler? just yeah. yeah. I have just basic Word template that I have. It's you know I don't use any software that helps me you know, figure out character arcs or anything mm -hmm. like that. And I just, you know, I'll have another document that just, I just title scrap and I just throw ideas in there constantly. And sometimes I go through and clean it back up, but um, I rarely, you know, figure out what, you know, even the next three chapters are going to be much less the ending. Wow. That's pretty cool. And do you, do you like, um, do you go back or do you like, you don't go back till you finish? Uh, when you're writing a manuscript? Yeah, it depends. I might be at 200 pages in and feel a little bit disembodied from the work and feel like, all right, I need to go through and as I write the second half, I need to make sure I really understand what I wrote in the first <laughs> half. So I will go back through. I'm doing that right now with something just to just because you know, like I, I know I'm going to have to change some of this stuff. So let's go ahead and do it now. Um, but yeah, I think it's very important to finish it. Now, a lot of people struggle to finish manuscripts, and, and I always tell them, like, it doesn't matter if it's terrible. Just finish it. You can always go back, but you're always going to regret not finishing it. And I read on your reviews, too, you get the, um, you, get, you get kudos for your uh, pacing. So I'm kind of curious about that. Do you, is that something that you um, um, work on, or like, can you tell us a little bit about the pacing in your books? Yeah, I'm I'm a firm believer in in cutting things out. In fact, I have a tattoo on my arm that says "Kill Your Darlings." Um, I love that. There. Yeah, <laughs> um, my kids were kind of curious why I got that when I first got it. No, not you, darlings, right? It's not you. It's not you. Um, you know, I love the challenge of looking at a sentence and, and and going back and say, "How can I say that in as few words as possible? How can I how can I create new verbs <laughs> that mm -hmm. that." you know, take 10 words and give me the same impact and, and for the, for the economy of one. Um, you know, I, I just think it, first of all, it's a challenge, but I love, you know, I, I, I just love um, being able to burn through, through a book quickly, but absorbing everything. Um, so I don't, I won't spend a lot of time describing something, but when I describe it, I want to make sure it's evocative and almost visceral. Like you get it, hopefully without me having to go into like a whole paragraph describing it. Um, so some, and sometimes, you know, when you describing a smell can be much more powerful than describing, you know, what something looks like. Um, so I'll, I'll go there. Um, but yeah, so I, I really, I really cut a lot out and what that, 
what that ends up doing, and I, I'm a big fan of short chapters, and what that ends up doing is people, <laughs> you know, inadvertently, I never thought about this, but people will tell me, like, I couldn't put your book down because I'm like, oh, I'm only a page away from the end of the chapter. And then they keep going because they're like, oh, the next chapter is only four pages. And so it really kind of almost forces them to keep reading if it's if it's interesting. Um, but that wasn't my intention, but I, I hear that quite a bit. I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, so the James Patterson style now, is what he does, his chapters are like, a page or two sometimes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Going. Uh, he, he, it's, it's working okay for him too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not quite at that level, <laughs> but like when you write, you should, for me, I, 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 if I'm writing well, I can hear beats. I can hear the beats of the words and, and, it's, and it's rhythmic and it's, and like, and it's almost like lyrics, right? Like, okay, this is a fast paced scene. It's a scary scene. It's a scene of paranoia. This is, this is almost the BPM that I should be feeling when I'm reading this to, you know, for myself and I can feel when it's working and I can feel when it's not. So that's why I try to strive for. Hmm. And I see that, it, uh, well, if, if people watching the video versus the audio, but uh, I love your, uh, your, your bookshelf back there. You have a lot of books now. So you're, you're, so, you're, so, you're so you're a big reader now it looks like. I do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I do. I do read, I read every day. I mean, and I have read every day for, mm -hmm. for, you know, probably 30 years, but um, but I typically I read in bed. Um, if I read during the day, I feel guilty because I feel like I should be writing. <laughs> but when I read in bed at night, it depends. You know, I might it could be five minutes because I'm tired. Mm, yeah. um, so sometimes it'll take me a while to get through a book. Sometimes I burn through it faster. And do you still read? Do you read fiction, thrillers, and mysteries? Or I really don't. Yeah, yeah very, very rarely read. Um, uh, certainly thrillers. I read thrillers if I'm asked to blurb. Mm -hmm. um, but I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, I'm a big fan of nonfiction uh, biographies. I love, um, but um, and literary fiction or you know, whatever. People just give me stuff, so I'm like, oh, it looks interesting, so I'll read it. So I'm not too <laughs> too picky, but uh, I tend not to read thrillers. I was curious. You had mentioned that you're, you're uh, in the dead husband. Your characters are two sisters. Is uh, how is that for from a male writer getting into the head of female characters is that a challenge are you worried about that how does that work <laughs> it, it can be I, it was my, my on my third book my third published book i was the first time i shifted to write fully from um the point of view of um, a female lead and it was very freeing because you know when you write from your own gender in my opinion or in my experience i tend to like oh this person sounds just like me um, and people will even say, oh, that person sounded just like you. And I don't really like that. So I'm like, I want to be somebody totally different than who I am. And so I started writing and I've written several books from a, a female point of view and I love it. I, you know, and that's not to say it's easy, but it's what I have learned is, you know, I, I'm dealing with people who are in extraordinary circumstances, usually extraordinarily harsh circumstances. And I don't sit there and think about, well, what would a woman do versus a man? I think about what would a human being in this circumstance do? Um, and that frees me to kind of just explore humanity rather than, you know, um, you know perspective from a particular gender. Um, and, you know, my, my girlfriend is the first person who reads my manuscript. She edits it. You know, my agent's a woman. My editor's a woman. So I have plenty of people who give me, who are there for great feedback. Um, but it, it, it allows me to, to, to create a voice that's wholly different, I think, from my own. And how about the, uh, the pandemic that we've been going through? How has that uh, affected you? Has that changed your, your writing process or your system? Or? Yeah, it hasn't really, you know, it's, I, I think, you know, I've still been able to, to, to manage my quotas. You know, we've all knock on wood, been healthy, you know, in, in my circle. Um, you know, it always comes up the idea of like, well, you know, how do we, how do we write about this? Do we write about this? Uh, the dead husband actually, um, uh, I ended up having to, um, set back in time a couple of years because it was bleeding into 2020 towards the end of it. And, you know, that's, I think a little jarring for readers to be like, what, they're just out at a restaurant. <laughs> you know, that doesn't yeah. make any sense. So that's a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a struggle. Like how do we, how do we address current day stories? And do people really want to hear about the, the pandemic, but how can you, 
ignore it. You know, you can't just not mention it. So um, I haven't had to deal with that too much yet. And actually what I'm working on now takes place in the eighties. And so nope, there is, a, there is, there is a bit of like just this blessed nostalgia feeling like, Oh, do you remember <laughs> arcade games? And <laughs> so it's been, it's been a nice escape for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember those days actually having to go someplace physically to an arcade to put yeah. quarters and to put coins into the machine. <laughs> totally. I just wrote a scene that, went on for way too long that I haven't, you know, cut yet, but will get cut in a mall that has an arcade, um, you know, element to it. And just the joy of just writing all that and re-researching the games and just like in my, you know, cause I was a teenager in the eighties. So it was like, it was, it was, it was very cathartic. Yeah, yeah, I can just imagine that'd be that'd be kind of cool. And so, um, so what are you working on next now? It's uh, are you where are you in your next project? So the Dead Husband comes out in May, as you mentioned. Um, so the the next book comes out next April. That's going to be titled The New Neighbor, and again, that also takes place in the same fictitious town in New Hampshire and the same house, this mansion, just a different set of characters. But there is some. There's some bleed over um, with you know the new occupants of the house trying to figure out um, about the history of the house, and then I have then I'll have another book coming out in um, sometime in uh, 2023, which is this 80s one that I'm working on now. So um, that's still that's still about halfway done at this point. Cool. And do you usually do you work on on two projects at the same time, or are you like writing one, editing the other, or how does that? Yeah, I mean, I'll certainly finish a project, you know, and then it goes to the editor and I'll, I won't sit there and wait, I'll start writing something new, but then the editor will come back and with your, you know, say your first level edits, which could take a month. Um, and then I just drop what I'm working on and I spend a month working on that. I can't juggle two things at once, but, but, you know, I will take that month and do that and put that to bed and then move back to the project. So I'm, that's what I'm making that transition right now, going back to my, what was this book about? Again? <laughs> so it gets a little confusing, but, uh, but yeah, I would never write two things at once. I don't think my brain would, would, would handle that very well. And is this the first time that you've had like a common thread in your books since they're all been standalones? Yeah. I mean, I'll definitely have, I definitely had books where I'll make mention of, of events that happened in other books, but it might just be a passing kind of a uh, Easter egg kind of a thing. Um, but this is the first that it's, you don't need, you won't need to have read one to read the other. Um, but when you do read both of them, there will be kind of a synergy there that, that, that I think the readers will get a kick out of. Cool. And you mentioned that you did a research, you went to uh, New Hampshire. Is that the, you physically went there and checked it out? Or is that you need to do that? To, to get a, Yeah. I mean, I did that more for fun, but it was also like, I'm not really familiar with New Hampshire. I don't have much of a connection to New England, but I like New England as a, as a setting, uh, particularly if I'm writing books that take place. Most of my books take place in like a couple weeks or a month or something like that. So if that happens to be in the fall, um, and I want to have kind of a little bit of a, a creepy vibe to the book. I certainly like New England um, for that. So, so yeah. So I went out there and spent a few days and just kind of skulked about, and uh, you know, it was more an excuse than anything. But <laughs> but there was something kind of to it of just like, okay, this is where she works. This is where she lives, and just making those decisions. Mm -hmm. But you made up the town though, right? The, in your book is. Yeah, the yeah. town is Bury. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So it's this kind of creepy little affluent town full of uh, people who know everything about each other. Yeah, that sounds. I, I read the the blurb. I haven't read your book yet, but I read the blurb, and that was like, oh, that sounds really fascinating. Like in that whole world of you know, kind of like a gated community type world. <laughs> yeah, and it was fun to actually like you know almost physically map out like, oh, this is the main street, and here are the stores, and whether you use that in the book or not, it was kind of neat to just kind of establish that and just like, okay, now this is the world that I've created, and and if I use this in the next book, um, you know, now I have a map for it. Cool. All right, uh, Carter, well, before I let you go, I always like to ask my guests about, because uh, I have aspiring writers on the uh, subscribe to the podcast. What's uh, any advice for the for, for an aspiring writer? Oh, lots, but I'll distill it. I mean, kind of the, the, you know, the three things that helped me the most. One, just, you know, I, and I'm sure every writer on your podcast says this, just write, you know, don't, don't sit there and ruminate about is this good, is this bad. Uh, it'll probably be bad, but just write, get it done. And that will take a huge burden off of you. Um, embrace rejection for sure. 
um, because you're going to probably get a lot of it and there's a lot of good to be mined from it. And for me, goal setting was huge. You know, I never started writing that day and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to become a best selling novelist. I started writing that day. I said, I'm going to finish this and I finish it. I'm going to get an agent little steps, uh, you know, and, and before you know it, you're going to be, you know, publishing, but, you know, having those goals and, and, and sticking to them really is important. Yeah, it definitely has baby steps. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, this, it's been 18 years for me, you know, so it's not like I had seven novels done in seven years. So this yeah. is, it's, it, it takes time. All right. Well, thanks uh, for being on the podcast. The Dead Husband's out May 4th, I believe is the, uh, is yep. the day, but uh, like I said, uh, by the time this airs, you'll, it'll, it'll be out there. So go, go check it out. And uh, thanks so much, Carter, for being on the uh, podcast. Enjoyed talking to you. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. I really appreciate it. Thanks.